Hi folks, I'm Adam, your instructor. Welcome to the Laney College Machine Shop. Today, we're going to be working on the FinderScope project for Machine Tech 210, the introductory course in machining and manufacturing. Specifically, we're going to be working on the shield, which attaches to the end of the tube where the main objective lens is located. The primary purpose of this component is to block stray light and minimize condensation. We're going to take this 1.5 inch ID by 1 and 3 quarter inch OD black plastic tube and turn it into this part, doing all the lathe and mill work. Before we get started on the machine, let's just take a few moments to review the features on the three-dimensional solid model and the specifications on the drawing. The three-dimensional solid model shows that this part is very simple, probably the simplest part we're going to machine on this entire project. It's just a straight-up tube with an inside diameter and an outside diameter and some length. I mean, <laughs> it's a little bit more complex than that, but not by very much. There's a pretty fat chamfer on one side, which is decorative, and there are also three countersunk holes, which are equally spaced around the circumference of the tube around one end. The hole-making operations will have to be done on the milling machine, so that adds a dash of intrigue to this otherwise straightforward lathe part. All right, here's the drawing. Before we jump into the views, let's get a lay of the land. Down in the title block at the bottom right, we can see that the title of the part is Shield. Next to that on the left, we can see that the material is going to be Black Delrin, which is the trade name for acetyl plastic. There are no special finish notes for this part because it's already the color we want it to be. Further to the left, you can see the tolerance block, which specifies our standard shop tolerances for the different dimensions on the print where no other tolerance is specified. These are all based on significant digits, so the number of places after the decimal point determines the tolerance of that dimension. We'll also be looking for a standard 125 micro inch finish on all of the surfaces, and we're going to interpret everything on this print according to ASME Y14.5-2018, the most recent standard for print specifications. Okay, looking at the views themselves, we can see that an isometric view of the part has been provided for our reference. Always helpful. And we're given two orthographic projection views, what I would call a front view and a left side view, both of which are also section views, because there are features inside of the part that we want to see. There are a bunch of dimensions which specify the diameters of the round features, as well as some lengths. There's also a chamfer callout, and on the left-hand side of the view, there's a cutting plane line, which reveals another section view, shown to the left, the one that I'm calling the left side view. The purpose of this view is to show the orientation of the three radially spaced holes. Let's try to get a sense of the overall dimensions of this part so we know what we're dealing with. It looks like the largest diameter is that 1 inch 750 thousandths stock surface of the tube we're going to use as raw material. The overall length is specified as 2 inches 880 thousandths. So 1 and 3 quarters of an inch by almost 3 inches is the size that you should visualize in your head. Okay, looking at the dimensions a little bit closer now, we can see that the outside diameter of the part is going to be that 1 inch 750 thousandths stock dimension, but we're going to take a minimum cut just to clean it up and create a nice machined surface to get rid of any offensive blemishes on the stock surface. The inside diameter is kind of interesting, because the size is not directly given here. Instead, it's specified as a clearance fit of 3 thousandths to 10 thousandths on the diameter to feature 2. So we have to backtrack a little bit and do some calculations. If you'll recall, feature 2 is labeled on the tube drawing as the outside diameter of that part. This was also a stock surface on which we took a minimum cleanup cut, so its actual size will depend on how much material you removed. 
you'll need to know the outside diameter on your tube in order to cut the inside diameter of your shield to the correct size with the appropriate fit. The left side edge of the part has a big honkin' chamfer on it, 100 thousandths long by 45 degrees. We can also see that there are some countersunk holes at a distance of 375 thousandths from the left side. The holes' profiles and orientations relative to one another are shown in the left side view. There are three of them, and they're specified as 150 thousandths diameter holes, which only go through one side of the tube. And they also have 280 thousandths diameter countersinks, but special attention needs to be paid to the included angle of the countersinks. All the other countersinks that we'll make on this project are 90 degree countersinks, but these will be 100 degree countersinks. This is important for the special flathead screws we'll use to attach the shield to the tube, which also have a head angle of 100 degrees. This shallower angle is common for screws, which go through relatively thin-walled material. The last thing to mention is that the holes are equally spaced at 120 degrees apart around the circumference of the tube. Okay, that's pretty much it for the print. I think we're ready to start making chips, so let's head out to the shop. The first step is to cut our stock. So go ahead and take a combination square and set it to 3 inches, and then use that as a stop to set the stick out of the stock material in the bandsaw. Tighten it, and then we'll cut all the way through. Remember that this is the 1.5 inch ID by 1 and 3 quarters of an inch OD black Delrin tube. This plastic is very nice to machine, a lot like aluminum actually. Although, like all plastics, chip control can be an issue. Let's gather up some tools. We'll need the turning facing tool slash chamfering tool, which was ground out of high speed steel, and an indexable boring bar with this carbide insert. And that's actually all we need for the lathe operations, but we'll be back to grab some more tools before we do the hole making operations on the mill. Go ahead and install your part into a three jaw chuck with about an inch of stick out. Go ahead and tighten the chuck, but not excessively. We just want the minimal amount of clamping pressure here to fully secure the part. This part has a relatively thin wall and it would be very easy to crush it and deform it. All right, install the turning facing tool Turn on the spindle and then touch off on the face of the part. Then take a minimal cleanup cut on that front face, something like 20 thousandths of an inch. Clear those chips and you can see that they get pretty stringy. Then loosen the chuck and flip your part around so that we can work on the other side. Again, an inch of stick out and tighten the chuck with minimal clamping pressure. Okay, turn the spindle back on, touch off on the face of the part, and then take a minimal cleanup cut on this face. Now we can remove the part and measure the overall length with dial calipers. And this looks like it's at about two inches, 953 thousandths. Write that down. Stick the part back in just as before, one inch stick out, tighten it down. Turn the spindle on and do a very, very minimal touch off on the end face. I'm going to set the digital readout to that measured value of the overall length of the part. And then I'm going to take successive cuts on the front face of the part until I get down to my desired overall length, which is 2 inches 880 thousandths. I'm not going to show how I do this on the digital readout because it's exactly the same way that we did it for the tube earlier. And I fully believe that you can figure out how to do it on your own for this part. So this first roughing cut is something like 50 thousandths of an inch, and then this final cut is around 20 thousandths, whatever it takes to get down to that overall size. All right, now take the turning facing tool out and let's install the boring bar. Touch off with the boring bar on the inside diameter of the tube. Then take a minimal cut just to clean up the inside surface. It looks like we didn't quite clean up everywhere, so I'm gonna take another deeper cut. And yeah, that doesn't really look like it's cleaning it up completely either, so I'll take another cut as well. And that looks like it's actually cleaning up for us. But in my excitement, I may have overlooked something here. I forgot to set the stick out of the boring bar in the tool holder so I could clear all the way through the part. Since our part is approximately three inches long, I need to be sticking out 
at least three and a quarter of an inch. And so I've made the adjustment here. Since I adjusted the tool, I sort of lost my spot on the digital readout, so I need to retouch off on the inside surface again. And then take another minimal cleanup cut. I think these cuts have been something like ten thousandths of an inch, but at least this time I can make it all the way through. Okay, we can finally take a measurement of the inside diameter, just with dial calipers, and this is looking like 1 inch, 479? The inside of the shield needs to fit over the outside of the tube with a clearance of 3 to 10 thousandths of an inch. When we cut the outside diameter of the tube, it came out to 1 inch, 491 thousandths. 1 inch, 491 thousandths, plus 3 thousandths is 1 inch, 494 thousandths. 1 inch, 491 thousandths, plus 10 thousandths is 1 inch, 501 thousandths. So that's the size range for the inside diameter of our shield. And I'm just going to shoot for the middle of that range. Just to be clear, the dimensions that you're going to use on your shield are going to depend on the outside diameter of your tube, and this is going to be a little bit different than what it came out to on my part. So you're going to need to do all these calculations for yourself. Anyway, let's take a final cut here. And that came out to 1 inch 496,000, so we're right smack dab in the middle of the range. Looks good to me. Just a quick check with the tube to make sure that it slips in. Fantastic. All right, we're done with the boring bar, and now we're going to install the chamfering tool. Just like this, flipped around in the tool holder so that it's pointing at the face of the part. This allows us to access both the inside and outside edges. All right, we'll touch off on that inside surface and go in maybe just 15 thousandths, just to break the edge. Then we'll touch off on the outside edge, and we're actually going to go in a whopping one hundred thousandths on the z-axis. And actually maybe just a hair more, ten thousandths, twenty thousandths, something like that, because we still need to take a cut on the outside diameter of this part. Okay, remove the part. Believe it or not, the lathe operations are basically done now. I told you this was a simple part. There are some sharp edges still on one side of the part, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Let's gather up some more tools. We'll need a number 4 high-speed steel center drill, a number 25 high-speed steel twist drill, which has a diameter of 150 thousandths, and a half-inch high-speed steel countersink with an included angle of 100 degrees. It's super important that you grab the 100 degree countersink and not the 90 degree countersink we're using for basically every other hole on the Finderscope project. They look almost identical, but the difference is critical. All right, onto the mill, and I've still got the indexing head set up from before when we did the hole making operations on the tube. And that's good because that is exactly the same device that we need here. Go ahead and install the part and clamp it down. And we'll set the starting position to 60 degrees instead of zero degrees so that we can get the chuck jaws out of the way. We'll be sort of working in between two of the chuck jaws. And that just makes sure that we don't have any interference issues between the drill chuck and any of the tools. Okay, clean the tapers on both the drill chuck and the spindle, and then install the drill chuck and tighten it down with the drawbar. Now we're going to install an edge finder, and this is the half inch diameter edge finder, which I recommended that we switch to in the previous video for making the holes on the tube. This will make it much easier to touch off on the sides of this relatively large diameter tube. Okay, start the spindle, no more than a thousand RPM, and then position the table so that the edge finder is toward the back side of the part. Bring the quill down so that the tip of the edge finder is halfway down on the part. Then move the part toward the edge finder so the tip of the edge finder goes concentric and then pops out. Set this position to zero on the y-axis on the digital readout. Then pop the quill up and move the edge finder to the other side of the part. Drop the quill back down. And again, push the part into the tip of the edge finder so it goes concentric and then pops out. Press the half button and then the y-axis button to set the y-axis zero to the center of the part. And then move the table to that zero point because this is where we're going to want to put our holes. Okay, now let's touch off on the end of the part. 
drop the quill down, move the table along the x-axis so that the end of the part pushes against the tip of the edge finder, it goes concentric, and then pops out. Now set this position to zero on the x-axis. Pop the quill back up. Since we're trying to find an edge, we now have to account for the diameter of the tip of the edge finder. The diameter of this edge finder is a half inch, or 500 thousandths. So we need to move over an additional amount equal to half of that value, half the diameter, meaning the radius, to move the center of the spindle over the edge of the part. Half of 500 thousandths is 250 thousandths. So we'll move the table along the x-axis, that amount, and then zero out the x-axis right there. From there, we'll move into our hole position, which is 375 thousandths. Okay, we can take the edge finder out, and it's time to put in the center drill. Go ahead and spot the first hole, then take out the center drill and install the number 25 twist drill. Then drill all the way through one side of the tube. Now we're going to index the part 120 degrees from our starting position. So 60 degrees plus 120 degrees should get us to 180 degrees. Now we can repeat that process, first with the center drill to spot the hole, and then the number 25 twist drill to drill all the way through one side of the tube. Okay, make another 120 degree index. 180 plus 120 should get us to 300 degrees now. And then spot and drill one more time. Okay, time for the countersink. The 100 degree countersink. <laughs> Not the 90 degree countersink. I know, I'm a broken record, but this is an easy mistake to make. Alright, let's start pecking at this hole to generate a countersink. And I'm just taking little bites here and then measuring across the top of the countersink with a dial caliper to dial in that specific size that we want. The drawing specifies a diameter of 280 thousandths, but we have to remember that we still need to take a cut on the outside diameter of the part, so we need to make this countersink a little bit bigger to compensate. It's going to get a little bit smaller once we remove material from the outside diameter of the part. So I'm shooting for a diameter of about 300 thousandths here, that's roughly 20 thousandths of an inch over what the specification is. Notice also that I'm measuring along the circumference of the part rather than along the axis of the part. Since this is a round part, the surfaces sort of fall off either side of center, so the dimension of the countersink is going to be different in the two measured directions. Just a little nuance to keep in mind. Okay, now that I've dialed in the size, I'm going to bring the non-rotating countersink to sit inside of the countersink on the hole. Then I'll set the z-axis on the DRO to zero at this position. Now on the other two holes, I should just be able to cut to zero and produce a countersink of the same size. Alright, let's index 120 degrees back to 60, then countersink this hole to the zero on the z-axis, index one more time to 180 degrees again, and then countersink the last hole. Cool, now we can take out the part. The very last thing that we need to do is take a minimal cleanup cut on the outside diameter of the part, because that stock surface, let's be honest, just doesn't look very good. Here's a cool work holding trick that we can use to accomplish this. Go ahead and assemble the shield onto the tube that you made earlier. Make sure to line up the holes. Now grab three of the special flathead screws with a 100 degree included angle on the bottom of the head and a Phillips drive. And we'll also need a Phillips screwdriver. Install the screws through the shield into the tube, tighten it with the screwdriver, kind of loose at first just so you can get all the screws in, and then finally tighten all three of them. Good and tight. Now head back to the lathe and install those copper shims onto the jaws of the three-jaw chuck. Mount the whole shield plus tube assembly into the three-jaw chuck with maybe a half of an inch between the end of the shield and the front of the chuck jaws. Now we'll need the turning facing tool. Turn on the spindle, touch off on the outside diameter of the shield. Dial in a minimal cleanup cut of, I don't know, maybe 10 thousandths or so, and then take the cut. And this isn't really cleaning up, so I'm gonna have to take a deeper cut than I thought. I think the total here is like 20 thousandths or so. 
Anyway, once it looks like it's cleaning up, take the cut all the way down the length. I'm sure you're noticing that these plastic chips are very stringy. They do not like to break. It's almost impossible to get plastic chips to break. One thing that you can do is just stop the spindle, pull the tool out, clear the chips with a brush, then go back in and restart the cut. It's not super satisfying, but it works. Okay, just rotating the part to see if we cleaned up the entire surface, and it, it looks like we still need to go a little bit deeper. So here I'm taking another very small cut, I don't know, five ten thousandths or so. Kind of running into that same chip control issue, and oh, there we go. Bird's nesting. So you really gotta stop the spindle, clear the chips, and then restart the cut. Anyway, it looks like the surface cleaned up really nicely despite this, although it also looks like I may have nicked the head on one of the screws. This just means that the head of the screw wasn't far enough below the surface of the part. So one of the things that you can do to fix this is open up the countersink a little bit more by just freehand pressing the part up into a spinning countersink. It's a super easy thing to do, so don't hesitate to do it. Just an addendum here about chip control when cutting plastics. You're not going to get the chips to break, so just give up on that idea. But the next best thing is to direct the chips out of the way of the cutting zone and the chuck. The best way to do that is to take a big bite and feed the tool really fast, just like you see here. It comes off as this ribbon that sort of shoots out away from the part. It's pretty cool, actually. Another thing you can do is just simply use an air blast to direct the chips out of the area. And a third and final trick that somebody showed me is to cut grooves along the length of the part so that when you take your turning cut, the cut is uh, broken up into small sections so the chips just can't get very long. I think this solution is really ingenious, although I have to admit I haven't played around with it too much. Anyway, we're done with the turning facing tool, so let's flip it around to get the chamfering end. We'll break the inside edge just, I don't know, maybe 15 thousandths, and then we'll do the same to the outside edge. Okay, we can remove the assembly. This part is done. Looking pretty good. Certainly better than it did when we first started. So if you made it this far, go ahead and treat yourself to an ice cold beverage, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.